joined now by someone who worked alongside David Tennant on his very first series of Doctor Who and was also there for Tennant's last story and in between the two worked on all sorts of iconic monsters as well as working across Sarah Jane Adventures and Torchwood. So I'd like to introduce supporting artist and monster performer Richard Tennessee. How are you? I'm very well thank you Alex, yes not too bad at all, thank you. And are you managing to uh, keep yourself busy during these rather odd times? Yeah, fairly. Um, yeah, I work um, in the NHS at the moment. So, yeah, as a mental health nurse, so I'm very busy with that. We've been working straight through, which is good. Yeah, of course. I, yeah, must must be busier than ever, I suppose, at the moment. But uh, I, I wanted to take you back to a time before the NHS yes. when you were very busy here in Cardiff. I, I was wondering how you first got into the world of television and film? Yeah, so um, many, many years ago, when I was about 17, I did um, some acting lessons, but I didn't pursue it beyond just just a short period of time. So it didn't really go kind of very far. So I think, I think acting was always something or performing that I wanted to kind of do. So I ended up joining a casting agency um, back at the beginning of 2006. And um, I think I'd been on their books about two weeks when I got a call from the, the agency saying, you're the right size and build and various other things. Um, you know, I did a lot of martial arts back in the day. They quite liked the idea of body movement, um, that kind of thing. And dancing, I was always um, quite keen on as well, just, you know, in, in my own time, not professionally. Um, so there was that side of things as well. So, yeah, I had got the opportunity, got called up and said, would I like to audition for a monster in Doctor Who and that was it and I just thought why not so I went down to the BBC studios near Cardiff and, and auditioned. So this would have been very early supporting art, artist work for you in general then? Yeah yes yeah. so I'd literally um, only probably I think I was registered with one, uh, one other agency at the time that I'd registered with a couple of months before and I might have done I think one job or two something like that and then suddenly there was like an audition um i didn't look for it it literally just was one of those things where you you know the call happened and i thought well why not i used to watch the, the show as a kid and i enjoyed it um i'll go and see what that's about uh, so it must have been quite something not to just be auditioning for a part as you know as yourself but with all the prosthetics that must have been a totally new experience yeah, it was it was it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, the I remember going to the very first kind of um, fitting and that side of things, and kind of walking into the the studio, and um, yeah, sort of you know, obviously um, meeting the the other kind of performers and and sort of seeing some of that taking place and kind of being filmed while I was kind of preparing to go forward, and it had a real kind of um eerie kind of ambiance about it because there was some you know the, the whole set and the way it was being filmed and the lighting it just had this um very unusual kind of quality and feel so it was yeah it was very exciting and different um but very very enjoyable oh i'm glad to hear it because i suppose by that point you know doctor who had been back for a year it was already you know it was now an established success were you one of many that had never done it before or, or had most of them been in the series before yeah so there was a few from yeah for obviously from talking about the monster side of things there was a few chaps there so um yeah i mean if, if you go to the actual audition itself i suppose that's the, the you know the first part of it the bbc bbc studios with elsa um there were a few chaps there that had done it in 2005 had been playing the Cybermen and, and some of the other monsters that um, took place during that series. Um, I can't remember exactly. I think there was probably like about four people, maybe five, maybe even six actually that were there. And so when I auditioned, there were some new people um, as well. So yeah, so so there was like at least, I'm just trying to think at the audition, there was probably about 10 of us, 12 of us, something like that. And that audition would be the first time that you know, you're in prosthetics, you're in a costume. So that must have been such a bizarre experience, not only to be under all this, but then to be trying out movement, and, you know, everything sort of on you at once, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, 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 it was because um, it was it was like a big sort of, uh, 
I don't know, yeah, I suppose a studio room, um, which had some stairs in it and things like that, and you had to put on a prosthetic um, head and you had to be able to move and, and navigate with limited vision, um, you know, and see how you could move and how you could manage going up and down stairs, that kind of thing, crawling around on the floor, moving different limbs in different positions. Um, so there was definitely that assessment kind of process to it. Um, and it, in fact, I think at that point I, I got put on the reserve list. So I wasn't actually picked immediately. I got put on a reserve list and then, and that was, I think a Friday. And then I got the call Monday saying I was picked or something. It was something like that, I believe. Um, and then from there on, it was the, the Ood cause that was the one before. Um, and then things kind of. So, you know, you, you've auditioned for the part that is obviously, as I say, quite, quite early on for you to actually make it onto set. How, how sort of supportive were the people around you of the prosthetics that you're working with, particularly if this was the first time you'd worn it all? Yeah, very supportive. Um, in fact, they're managing the costumes um, and that side of things. So it was it was very well organised. There was plenty of people. They um, you probably had about four people. I think normally at any one time representing Millennium Fex because you'd have somebody normally with a remote control that would be managing maybe the animatronic head of say the lead creature or monster, um, and then you'd have the other uh, staff kind of managing the costumes and then. Um, you know, there was other things they had to do. They might have to put a liquid on or some sort of oil to make something look more shiny. Um, and they'd engage with you in different ways. Um, so yeah, it was very, uh, interesting how it all kind of panned out really. Cause from there, you know, you then crop up an awful lot in the show as both yourself and a monster performer. Is it sort of that once they know you can do it, they ask you back time again? I think so. I think it. I think what I realized it's about being reliable. So no matter what time the shoot, cause some of the shoots were quite early. You might have, I think sometimes there was even a six thirty, seven o'clock shoot, that kind of thing. And you might be around for 12 hours. Sometimes I think the longest I did was maybe 13 or 14 hours on one Jadoon shoot. Um, so it's a very long day. That's fine. You know, I was dedicated that that was the only thing I was doing for the day. Um, Obviously, it would pay that bit better as well. You're fed, which is great. You'd get there at some point. You'd have a, a decent full kind of breakfast. You'd get lunch. There's always plenty of liquids and refreshments. Um, so, no, it was fine. And I think, yeah, it was about making that commitment just to always make make sure you got to the location um, and being reliable. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it was it was great fun. I was earning money. I was blending the work around some other things that I was doing as well, but trying to be as available as I could be um, in order to, you know, enjoy the, the opportunity that was presented to me. Just then when you return to the show, you're working on the Christmas special that was, I suppose, also partly done very publicly on location. How different is it to not only be in these creature suits, but then have an audience because Doctor Who filming then and still does attract such a following when it's filming on location. Yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, you do find there are people kind of, yeah, hovering around and kind of watching in the background, maybe um, that kind of thing. But yeah, no, it was, yeah, I think it probably made it more enjoyable, really. Um, I think you're, you're sort of in this costume and I think I just really enjoyed trying to kind of um, you know, do the best you could to kind of create the the creature or present it in a particular way. Um, and there was something nice about the fact of, yes, you know, being behind that costume and also just doing your best to kind of, you know, execute the moves or the positioning and kind of moving through some sometimes quite complicated sets and having to step up and step down and various kinds of sequences um so yeah it was it was it was great fun but yeah it was always enjoyable i think having people around sometimes that you know the team the you know the the director team the ad's and what have you would um try and sort of move you around so that you weren't quite so visible because i think there's a lot of the time there are creatures aren't there that have never been seen um it, i think maybe things become a bit more relaxed um as as creatures become more known in in the show but when things are brand new or a new monster or something they want to keep that kind of a little bit more um, 
low key and under wraps. Yeah, of course. And one of the creatures that you were there for the very start of was the Jadoon and you came back to play them again. Yeah. How much were you sort of involved in the development of those or you, you sort of brought in after people like Paul Casey have developed them? Yeah, I think I got a feeling I kind of came in at the beginning, I think, of the Jadoon actually. Um, so yeah, obviously Paul Casey was the captain, had the animatronic head. Um, later on in the show, I did actually um, wear the animatronic head. It was one of the, one of the last things that I did actually. Um, as a creature on Doctor Who. Um, so that was in early, I believe, 2011. So, um, yeah, that, you know, that was, that was good fun. I think what the, the way they edited it in that show, there was a lot of monsters. So you don't get, there wasn't much screen time of my, it was myself and John Davy actually. Um, so yeah, I went, I'd been sort of asked to go to, um, Millennium Effects kind of HQ where they fitted me for the animatronic head. And then, uh, we did that. John Davy did it with me on this particular night shoot. Um, but yeah, so with the Jadoon, um, it was uh, with some of the suits, you actually had your name on it. Does that make sense? So the actual Jadoon head, because obviously you've got the helmet and, and most of us were in the, the heads with the helmet as opposed to the um, captain. So on the inside of the fabric, it had my name sort of written within it in the original costume. So without any prosthetic or animatronics, that must have perhaps been one of the more straightforward aliens you played? Kind of, yeah. It was an interesting one because you had like a piece of material that kind of hung in inside the, the helmet because um, you've got the like slits that we would be looking through. And I think that that material helped kind of that if any light was coming through, it didn't kind of reflect or bounce the light off your face or maybe you know to sort of show uh, yeah i suppose it was because you were sitting in a, a void so there was nothing too compressed um yeah absolutely there was definitely a monster in a related um show um tortured but i don't know if it's right you know whether we should talk about that now and that was uh, i wore the stunt head of the weevil uh, which has got so there was a an animatronic weevil head the, you know, the main kind of Weevil character. Um, and then there was a stunt head as well that had like a sort of um, a mechanical jaw that you could get your chin into and kind of open it. And that was incredibly uncomfortable. I've got, as you can see, a fairly long head. So in the getting it into, that was was quite quite uncomfortable. So there was one grueling experience of being in a, in a monster costume, but I... I I treated it well. I sort of took it as a meditation, a bit of a test of endurance. Um, and I, yeah, I, you know, it, it, was, it was uncomfortable, but, um, but it was good fun to have done it. And normally when I played a weevil, it was in a softer head. So you didn't have that at all. So once you've done something perhaps as uncomfortable as that, is it a case of you can cope with anything they throw at you then? It can't get much worse, I imagine. No, that was it. There was only one shoot with the the sort of um, this, yeah, this kind of mechanical jaw weevil head. And that was the only one. You could disengage the jaw in between the takes. So I would disengage the jaw and then to get on set, I'd kind of engage it back in. <laughs> but things like the Ood, Jadoon, you know, they came back time and time again. So it must be quite nice to to revisit some of these characters. And I suppose evolve them as the series progresses yeah i suppose so yeah that's that's a that's a good way of kind of putting it um yeah i mean obviously you'd have a kind of set movement if you like like elsa would uh, be the you know the person kind of teaching you how the particular monster moved and of course you'd you'd have to replicate that to the best of your ability but there would always be certain things um that you could slightly adapt or do something or move um, maybe slightly differently just to give a bit more of a unique twist maybe um, and I think I might have done that once or twice and you know not not to detract from the way the monster should move but um, yeah so no it was nice to um, yeah obviously try and interpret things in your own way if you could and obviously if if that went through then then it goes through doesn't it you don't know i mean i don't think there was ever anything that i did and and somebody kind of approached me and said no nope, you shouldn't be doing that there, there was never anything like that but there were little things that i think occasionally we all might have done just slightly 
differently or done an ad adaptation to the way um, the character moves. I, I was interested looking at your Doctor Who work, something like The End of Time, you know, David Tennant's final story, you're not just playing one part, you're there as one of the, the soldiers, you're an Ood, an alien in the bar. Is it that once you're sort of onto a production and they go, well, could you do you know, tomorrow, but as a different part, is that how it works? Or, or is it often that, you know, they want to block book you and just see everything that you can do on a story? Yeah, it's difficult to know. You're right. Yeah, that was probably where, yeah, I played more uh, the most things in any kind of episode. Um, yeah, I think it was probably about being around and sometimes you maybe you were there and you were on set you know you're in a dressing room and you're waiting to go and do a particular part and I think that's how I got to do the body double of David Tennant's kind of hands where there's a shot and the hands kind of come in on a keyboard and tack away on a computer um, and certainly I was doing the other things that, that you just said so I think probably um, it's as much about the opportunity that presents itself because you're there um so so and and it's always nice to kind of get a bit more involved and do different things so yeah it was it was always a pleasure to to do any of those parts and of course you worked across doctor who both with david tennant and matt smith many different companions but also sarah jane and sarah jane and torchwood how different was both doctor who and the spin-offs did it feel like the same show um I wouldn't say it felt like the same show. I mean, you'd have some similar, you might get some of the ADs kind of working across the different shows and stuff like that. Um, I mean, obviously they're into, there's the interrelationship between them, isn't there? Um, but yeah, I think they had their own kind of unique feel really. Um, I mean, on Torchwood, I, I sort of played myself once or twice. Um, otherwise I was mostly playing a weevil. Um, which was great fun. I really enjoyed that, that particular monster. Um, and then on Sarah Jane, I think I predominantly played, I think well, it was a Jadoon and a sort of black helmet visor character as well. Um, and, I, and I might have played, I think myself in there possibly, but yeah, it was, it was, it was nice and it was different. Um, but you, you would always be on with, you know, the other monster characters, the performers that, um you know but to that that kind of um whoever that group was at any one time on a particular show would there was a bit of fluidity so in the time that i did it there was probably i don't know about 15 guys that i might 12 to 15 guys because i think the most i was ever on set with well not the most because actually there was there was one episode where there was absolutely hundreds of us or I felt like there was hundreds of us but I mean you'd have a you know if they were doing a nude say and and the, uh, you could have I don't know 10 or 12 I think it was probably 12 of us um but they you know using a green screen and using multiple positioning you could make it look like there was a lot more of you um as you know um in, in the filming world so um yeah it could look like there was more performers than actually were there so that there's a there's a an episode of where the Jadoon kind of walk in and, and they kind of take, you know, take over. And there was only six of us, I think, but it looks like there's probably about 12, maybe 18 of us that walk in because we did lots of different, you know, takes to create that. And, and you mentioned that as well as playing the monster parts, you often played yourself or you know, more recognisable human parts. It must have been quite nice to have the best of both worlds really and and also on the same show yeah yeah that was nice yeah definitely um that's right because as i say originally the, you know the audition was was for the monster and then these other opportunities came forward as well um so yeah it brought um an ele element of variety to it um and yeah it's 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 i suppose it's quite nice playing yourself um i would have been probably quite content just to have played the monsters um but yeah it was it was good fun you know um being in different costumes and uh, again you know i suppose there's there's more of you in there in terms of how you're seen um but there is something quite nice about being a monster and and not having yourself visibly um seen there's something quite i don't know different about that that's um quite enjoyable as well about how you manifest that creature um to make it look convincing 
Um, but yeah, all, all of it was good fun. Yeah, I did enjoy all of it. Because I imagine throughout your time on Doctor Who, you'd have been across a lot of other shows as well. Was Doctor Who a particularly exciting or complicated one in comparison to other shows? Um, yeah, yeah, there was. Um, yeah, it was. I mean, it was very. I mean, obviously, it's science fiction. Um, I did, I think, between two and three years on a, a period drama called Lark Cries to Candleford. And that, that was really enjoyable because I sort of had long hair and I had mutton chops at the time and I was able to grow them and it kind of fitted with that Victorian kind of era. Um, and that was nice, you know, that was a very different set. Um, but I think there was something, and, and, and that was great fun and very enjoyable. And funny enough, I did play, perform rather on that with, with some of the people that also um, performed at various points within Doctor Who, whether it be as themselves or even... Um, as, as a creature um but yeah i would say probably doctor who if i had to identify i mean obviously it was the longest the whole period of time that i actually worked as a supporting artist doctor who was the the five-year block of that from early 2006 until early 2011 um so for me i think that will always remain um the sort of more special part of my filming days and i think the camaraderie that you get with the other chaps that you um, perform with as well there was something quite um, you know special about those relationships that you have and the kind of bonding that you you get as well it was and then you know meeting up with some of those people and having friendships outside of the show as well so yeah was, and I suppose uh, something that is is unique to Doctor Who was the live events which must be perhaps the most rewarding because you immediately get that response from kids you know it's not all, all to do with cameras and being long, long days on set. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I did enjoy that, definitely. Um, yeah, there was the scarecrows that we did um, live at some um, sort of seaside locations and things like that, and some events um, sort of in city centres as well with sort of stages and platforms and sort of little elements that you would act out or, and, and perform the creature. Um, along with, um, say, Matt Smith or other actors that might have some dialogue, and then you'd come on and, and do your performing part as the monster. Um, but yeah, no, the kids would would absolutely go crazy, um, and I did enjoy that. And I also enjoyed doing the Cyberman in the Millennium uh, Centre in Cardiff um, to the BBC or BBC Orchestra of uh, Wales um, and the Doctor Who theme. Um, and there was an occasion within that where um, at the end of the actual um, performance, I might the, the sideman head did actually unfortunately fall off. <laughs> so I quickly turned, kept in character and marched off as, as plan, which is what you do in a situation like that. But that gave us the opportunity to refit the head um, to ensure that that kind of wouldn't happen again. But the, these things can happen. And um, yeah, I think it probably brought a, a moment of interest to people. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, it was, all, it was always nice doing the live events as well, definitely. Yeah, yeah something totally different. Because obviously, you know, you don't always have an audience, but when you're rehearsing, how much time are you given as a creature performer to sort of work out the venue? Because, you know, on set, you have time to work out where the steps are and the door and all that. But I suppose in a live event, you, you just have to sort of go for it. Yeah, no. So what happened when it was the Millennium Centre, for instance, um, before anyone was in the actual auditorium, um, we were able to kind of, yeah, work it out. So I think we did a run through without the head on. Um, so I was in costume, but minus the actual Cyberman head. Um, and, and that's absolutely fine because you can see everything. And then you do a run through with the head. And the, obviously at that point, you've got the restricted vision. Um, so you're having to, you know, if you're going down steps and things, there's certain ways you'd move your feet to kind of fill the back of the step and stuff like that. Um, so you just got to try and confidently kind of move and go for it. Um, but things do go wrong um, and they go wrong both whether it's live or, or, or you know, um, in the studio, um, you know, uh, one of the my fellow kind of um, monster um, companions, they they actually did fall off the stage on one one occasion, which was very unfortunate. They did slightly hurt themselves, nothing major, nothing major, but it was one of those things. 
Um, yeah, so so things can can sometimes go wrong. And as you say, you you sort of since moved away from the life of a supporting artist. Was it just that you, you wanted to explore other things, or, or or suppose that doing some of the Doctor Who monsters was there a sense that it, you know you couldn't perhaps push it in a, a different direction? Yeah, it's it's kind of yeah. I never so. I think if I could have kept it going to some, in some capacity, I probably would have kept it running, but it was difficult to balance. Um, I needed to, uh, I suppose when I was doing it, I was working, when I started doing the, the, the filming on Doc 2, I was working as a counsellor. So I was counselling um, young sh- sort of children between 11 and 18 in, in kind of Wales and, and that area, sort of South Wales, mid Wales. Um, so I was doing that um, a couple of days a week and I was doing up a house at the time. Um, and the filming work blended very well. Um, but obviously it's not guaranteed and it's not always there. Um, so, so you've got to have an income. So I think that was the, 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 the thing that I sort of realized was I needed a more steady income. Um, and so I decided to, cause as I say, my background had been in sort of counseling and therapy and I'd worked in mental health and sort of drug and alcohol services, always predominantly supporting people in some capacity. Um, so I trained then as a mental health nurse and that was full time. It was a university degree. Um, and so I think doing the filming around that would have been difficult. And at the time it was um, probably more appropriate to kind of when I had time to do work and shifts around that training to, was to actually work in that area as a sort of healthcare assistant as an unqualified member of staff um, so yeah I miss it a lot I mean it's been what nine years over nine years probably February just gone which is incredible um, that all that time has elapsed and there's still guys that I, I worked with in the show that are still going strong um, and really enjoying it. Um, so that's nice to, you know, know that there are people that I was working with back then and they've been at it for like 15 years. Um, but you know, I'd never say never if, if the opportunity ever arose again, I'd, I'd certainly give it a go. Who knows? I might, um, rejoin the agency that I registered with and, and see, see what happens. Say I'm available if, if they need me to help out performing a creature on Doctor Who. You never know. Yeah, of course, yeah. The call may come, you never know. Yeah. So yeah. Amongst all of the parts you played, is there a favourite or perhaps most memorable character? Um, yeah, it's a good point. Um, I think I liked all of them in different ways. Um, I suppose there's certain ones that you play that less so or the creatures not you know as as prominent um for instance the hath um what wasn't you know a creature and that was an unusual costume um with that sort of glass tube and the green liquid and you had kind of like a straw thing that you could blow to get the bubbles moving through it and that that was quite uh, there was a there was a situation we, we we in that particular costume we were once in a shooting range in in wales and um, we had sort of flamethrowers on these guns and it was incredible the trust that goes into the fact that you'd press a button that would kind of ignite the flame and there you are moving through a set with someone in front of you with res- greatly restricted vision you've got to make sure that you're not going to torch the back of their head or their costume um, but I'm slightly digressing by saying that but no so nothing happened but it was it was it was good fun and it's just interesting what what can happen I think probably going back to your question um, I think the Jadoon has a very sort of powerful kind of feel about it, the way that it moves the, the creature. Um, so I think maybe the Jadoon, that, you know, the Ood was, was very enjoyable as well. The Cyberman, I probably played less so, but again, a great creature to play, obviously, you know, one that really stands out. So um, I don't know, it'd be between probably the Jadoon and the Cyberman, I think. Well, two characters that certainly are still in the show and you know, still have a very strong presence. And uh, I know we could touch upon all sorts of other creatures and yeah, humanoid parts you played. But I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time, Richard. It's been fantastic just to touch upon some of the things you've done. As I say, I know there's an awful lot more we could talk about. Thank you very much, Alex. It's a pleasure. Thank you. 